Well, nobody denies that from 1939 to 1945, there was a world war. Nobody denies that because millions of lives were lost. And nobody denies that the reason America got involved in that war was because Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Yet some, even many people, have denied the Holocaust. They deny that Hitler and the Germans tried to annihilate the Jews, that six million of them died in concentration camps and in gas chambers. Uh, and they deny it even though there are some 3,000 documents of it which were presented by prosecutors before war, war tribunals. Uh, and, and they deny it even though uh, there was first-hand testimony of survivors. Uh, and they deny it even though the Allied troops and forces gave testimony of the concentration camps they had just freed. And they deny it even though Nazi war cr uh, crime suspects never claim the Holocaust was fictional. They deny it even though there are countless films showing the atrocities of the mass burials. And they deny it by saying things like it blatantly never happened or it's an exaggeration or it was a conspiracy by the Jews in order to extract money from Germany to establish the state of Israel. In 1984, a man named James Kingston, a Canadian high school teacher, told his class that the Jews created the Holocaust to gain sympathy. And a man named Gamal Abdel Nassar, president of Egypt in 1964, said this. He said that no person, not even the most simple one, takes seriously the lie of six million Jews who were murdered. And so to this day, there are people who deny one of the most tragic events in history, and we shake our heads in unbelief at that. Yet even more amazing to us, and even more consequential, is that there are people, even Christians, who deny the resurrection of the dead. Not unlike the Sadducees in Jesus' day. Right? The resurrection of the dead is a foolish concept to some. Uh, and the Apostle Paul knew how dangerous and deadly this belief was. Uh, and he knew how it ripped the guts out of the gospel he proclaimed and destroyed those who believed it. Uh, so on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, I would like to consider what Paul considered in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 20, which is, what if there is no resurrection from the dead? What if Christians do not rise from the dead? And I'd like to do so in a, term, in a sermon titled, what if the dead don't rise? What if the dead don't rise? And I'd like to do so using two points, and it'll be in the back of your bulletin. The first one is the consequence of believers not rising from the dead. Second, the consequences of Jesus not rising from the dead. And so let's look at the consequence of believers not rising from the dead in verses 12 and 13. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Well, Paul starts by saying, now if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead. If Christ is preached. Right? And, and Paul has just told the Corinthians in chapter 15 what the gospel is in verses 3 and 4. He said, Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He just told them in a nutshell, in a verse, what the gospel is. Then in verses 5 to 8 of this chapter, he talks about all who saw Jesus alive after he died. He says this. He says he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. Uh, then the, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due, due time. Now, a lot of witnesses is what Paul is saying. There are a lot of witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice what Paul said he preached. He said he preached Christ. He preached Christ. He preached Christ. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said he preached Christ crucified. And then again in chapter 1, he said, we preach him, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. We preach Christ. And all of the apostles preach Christ and they preach the resurrection because they all saw him raised from the dead. The once were cowards, 
who were hiding behind closed doors became fearless to preach Christ and to preach his resurrection and, and proclaim that he did raise himself from the dead and God raised him from the dead. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 7, the Jewish leaders were greatly annoyed because the apostles were teaching the people that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And it bothered them. They said, stop preaching this man. In Acts 17, verse 31, Paul said to the philosophers in Athens that God had appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this. How do we know he's going to do that? By raising him from the dead. That's the assurance that he's going to judge the world by Jesus. He raised him from the dead. Paul told Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 2.8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He said in Romans 10.9 that the resurrection of Christ is essential if you are to believe and be saved. In Romans 14.19, right, the reason he was resurrected is so that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living, those who have died and are now with him and those who are still standing. He said in Romans 6, 9, we know that Christ has been raised from the dead and dies no more. He also said in Ephesians 1, 20, that, that God raised him from the dead and has seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So Paul and the other New Testament writers preached the resurrection of Jesus. Just read the book of Acts. You see the, you see the sermons that first Peter preaches and then Paul later on, always the death and resurrection, death and resurrection, death and resurrection. But remember also, Jesus himself said he would resurrect from the dead. In John chapter 2, verse 19, he said, concerning his body, destroy this temple. He said, and, and I'll raise it up in three days. Now, of course, the Jews thought he was talking about the physical temple, but Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days again, afterwards, I'll raise it up. Read in Matthew 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. He said in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. And in Matthew 27, 62, 63, the Jewish leaders went to Pilate. They went to Pilate. This is when Jesus is in the tomb. And they say, secure the tomb. Secure the tomb. They said, sir, we remember that while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Even his enemies remembered that he said he would resurrect in three days. They knew it. And he said in John 6, 40, that he would raise up all those whom the Father had given him. And in order for him to raise them up, that necessitates that he be raised up from the dead before that. Well, Paul says if Christ is preached, uh, that he has been raised from the dead, and now here comes the question, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? How is it that you would say that if he's been raised from the dead? Uh, so they didn't deny that Christ was resurrected. The proof was overwhelming that he was resurrected. In fact, many of the 500 brethren who saw him at one time, well, they were still alive. And they could have easily asked them uh, to verify that. Uh, and they believed in the resurrection of Jesus to the saving of their own souls. But some of them denied that the people of God would resurrect from the dead as well. Uh, and, and in reality, Jesus said that all men would be resurrected, saved and unsaved, when he came back again in John chapter 5. Right? Believers to the resurrection of life, unbelievers to the resurrection of condemnation. So some believed in Jesus' bodily resurrection, but not their own. And more than likely, they were influenced by the Greek philosophy of their day, which said the spirit of man survives death and goes into some eternal oblivion somewhere, but the body goes to the grave never to be raised again. In fact, the Greeks had a saying about the resurrection of the body. They said it is the hope of swine. That's a pig's idea, not a man's. So the Corinthians believed the soul alone would go to heaven. And this is extremely erroneous and does great injury to the faith of the saints. Uh, it, it does that. Uh, for the resurrection of the dead is the great hope of the faith. It is the consummation of our salvation. It is the hope of glory. 
It is the inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away and that is reserved for you right now in heaven. It is the, the promise of God that helps to pre preserve us, helps us to persevere through the many trials and tribulations we will go through. And not only are we waiting for it, and not only are we longing for it, but guess what? All of creation is waiting for it as well. For in Romans 8, 21 and 22, uh, we read that because when we are resurrected, when we get our new bodies on the last day, well, guess what? The creation which fell when we fell, well, that's good. that gets recreated new and perfect. And so all creation is waiting for the, the sons of men, the sons of God to be raised up again. Now, the reason are not rising from the dead is a massive error is because Paul says in verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Then Christ is not risen. Uh, and the reason that is the case is because we're united to Christ and he is united to us. We are in him and he is in us. And what happens to him happens to us. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, uh, it, it, where there it says that God has saved us, he has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. An amazing thought. Spiritually speaking, right now, every single believer is sitting with Christ in the heavenly places. Spiritually speaking. And I don't even understand that, honestly, to be honest with you. But that's what we are. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And in Colossians 3.3, 3, he says, you, you died and your life is hidden with Christ. And then in Colossians 1.27, he says that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Well, that glory is, is, is your resurrected body with your resurrected soul. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, because we are in Christ, we are new creations. So, so if Christ was raised from the dead, then so too will the people be that he died for. But if his people don't rise from the dead, then that means Christ was never raised from the dead either. So it makes no sense to deny the resurrection of Christians if Christ is not raised. But Paul says, hypothetically speaking, hypothetically speaking, if you are right, then the only logical conclusion is that Christ himself is still dead. That is the only logical conclusion. And he did not rise from the dead. You see, if you're, you're wrong on this essential doctrine of the faith, usually you will be wrong in other areas as well. And, and, to, and so to say the saints are not bodily resurrected brings with it a slew of other error. It's like a domino effect. right? Once you go down this path, you've, you've knocked down a lot of truth and you've stripped away a lot of the gospel. So Paul engages in a what if. What if, saying, if we don't rise, understand that means that Christ didn't rise, and if he didn't rise, that sets off this whole chain of events that no Christian wants to think about. And Paul names six realities, six realities if Christ is not risen. The first three are more theological, and the second three are more personal to the Corinthians. And so let's look at now the consequences of Jesus not rising from the dead. And that's in verses 14 to 20, and I'll read them again. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Well, here's the flow of Paul's argument. If we don't rise, that means Christ didn't rise. And if Christ didn't rise, that means, that means first of all, He's saying, our preaching is in vain. Our preaching is in vain. And vain means empty, worthless. It's a waste of time. It, that means anything Paul has ever said should be disregarded. That is, hours of preaching to them, well, they really have no value. 
No value. That means the words that he spoke or any preacher since then have no weight because the gospel they preach is really no gospel at all. That means the thousands of miles that Paul traveled preaching the gospel throughout all of Europe and Asia Minor was just an exercise in futility. You see, if, if you take Jesus' resurrection out of the gospel, what you have is a meaningless gospel because it can't help you and it can't save you and it can't change you. So, so we're preaching Christ crucified and, resurrection, uh, and resurrected for the salvation of souls, uh, but it's really a farce. They're just words. There's no reality behind them. We're just exercising our oratory skills. We're just peddling a message that has no hope. And so we read in Acts 4.33, we read there, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but, but that really means with great purposelessness. Uh, it was uselessness because their preaching was in vain because the resurrection of Jesus never happened. Uh, and that means the apostles and disciples were completely deceived or they were purposely deceiving the people. That means the good news they were promoting was really bad news, actually terrible news. I, I mean, think of it. We tell people to confess their sins and believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they'll be given eternal life. And that's what the Bible says, right? But... But Christ can't give them eternal life because he's not their Lord and Savior because he's still in the grave. So what folly it is to preach about a man who is still dead and in the grave. And what folly it is to preach about the power of the gospel when there was no power to even raise up Jesus from the grave. So then what you're really preaching is a message of morality or a message about honor or maybe integrity, about living, living the right life now. But in the end, in the end, we go where everybody goes, and that's hell. Thus, preachers and preaching and are preaching a powerless gospel that cannot save a soul. And, and, and what we're preaching is not based on historical facts, but on fiction. We're asking people to believe in a dead man to keep them eternally alive. Think about that. We're asking people... If this is all true, of course, all hypothetical, but we're asking people to believe in a dead man to keep them eternally alive and to give them eternal life, to keep them from becoming eternally dead. We're trying to sell them fool's gold. And fool's gold is really a mineral called pyrite, which basically resembles gold, but is absolutely worthless. And just a very quick short story, I remember many years ago before I was saved and somewhere in like 1985, some guy on the street says, hey, I got a gold necklace, I just got it, it's hot. You want it? I'm looking at it, I wow, it looks good. He goes, give me 20 bucks. I said, I gave him the 20 bucks. I go home, I show it to my wife who worked in the jewelry, the diamond dish, I say, hey, Claude, look at this. Look at this gold. She, looks at it. she takes out a loop, she looks at it, she said, it's garbage, throw it away. <laughs> I blew, and 20 bucks was 20 bucks back then. It's fool's gold, it's worthless. It's worthless. It can't save anybody. So our preaching is in vain. We have no real message. We might as well be like shilling snake oil or something. At least that won't damn somebody. And because Paul's preaching was vain, and all preaching since then is in vain, well, we can just toss out all the sermons they ever preached. Let's get rid of Charles Spurgeon. We don't need him. How about Whitfield, Luther, Calvin, Lloyd-Jones, and on and on and on. It's no good. Take down sermon audio and the 216,000 sermons on there. Get rid of all the books you own by great Christian authors who vainly talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And think of all the countless hours you've wasted listening to people like me, bringing you a hopeless message. And lastly, Dan, we can retire that, that speaker that we use for evangelism and find something better to do with that and our own Saturdays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, Paul says, if our preaching is empty, that means your faith is also empty. Because if Christ isn't risen, then you have believed the gospel that cannot save you. Right? You cannot save you. Uh, so the faith which, which you believe will get you to heaven is useless because you're trusting in a corpse to deliver you from damnation and eternal death. You're, you're trusting in a dead man to, to keep you alive. The gospel you have faith in cannot get you out of the grave because it couldn't get Jesus out of the grave. Now, millions of people today have an empty faith. We know that because they're not trusting in Christ's life and his death and his resurrection. 
as their only hope for righteousness, as their only hope for forgiveness, uh, and as their only hope for eternal life. But we would be in the same category if Christ was still in the grave. Then our faith would be no better than the Muslims or the Mormons or anybody else who's looking for something different. So if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty. And, and we're not talking about maybe small faith here. We're not talking about weak faith. Here. We're talking about empty faith. It is absolutely empty. Why? Because it can't make good on the promises of God. It can't make good. It's an empty faith because you're trusting in a God who isn't truthful, who said, because Jesus was raised, so too would you be raised. We saw it today in, Matthew, in Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. That's not true. Like 1 Corinthians 6.14, where Paul said that God raised up Jesus and he will also raise us up by his power. Well, you know what? He didn't raise him up, so we're not getting, we're not getting raised up either. And Romans 6.5 says, For if we have been united with, in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. But he didn't resurrect, so we're not going to be in the likeness of anything. So without Christ's resurrection, our faith is empty. Our faith in Jesus as the Son of God it's empty. It's useless because Romans 1.4 says that he, Jesus, was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. How was that? By the resurrection from the dead. It proved he was who he said he was. But if he didn't resurrect, well, then he wasn't who he said he was. Right? Or our faith and our justification, which means to be absolutely declared innocent in the high courtroom of heaven, is empty. Is empty. Because as Romans 4.25 says, that Jesus was delivered up, why? Because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification or for our justification. But if he wasn't raised, we can't be justified. We can't be forgiven. We can't be declared not guilty. If we're still guilty. And our faith that Jesus is interceding for us right now as our high priest right, in the courtroom of heaven, well, that's empty too. Romans 8.34 says, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is, who, is, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Praying for us. Praying for us. Well, he's not doing that. And he's not interceding for us because he's still dead. And dead men don't intercede for anybody. Our faith tells us that to live is Christ and to die is gain. But it's no gain at all, actually, if he's still dead. It's actually loss. Well, if he hasn't been raised from the dead, then we cannot be saved. Our faith is empty because Christ can't save us to the uttermost, as he said, as we read in Hebrews 7, uh, chapter 7. And it's empty because uh, there will not be a better resurrection with the saints are looking for in Hebrews 11. And it's empty because our, our faith is empty. Uh, and, and, and that means the church is basically one big gigantic fraud. Then Abel, who believed in God, was a fool. And Enoch, well, that's a myth. And Noah was a colossal moron for building an ark for 120 years for what reason? It means all the heroes in Hebrews 11 were actually victims of fraud. It means Stephen must have been hallucinating when he saw Jesus standing in heaven when he was being stoned to death. It means that we've been deluded uh, like, like, like those who say there was no Holocaust or some who say we didn't land on the moon. Well, how about this one? The earth is flat. You know, people still think those things. Or, or like the over 900 people who literally drank the Kool-Aid and killed themselves in, ja in the Jamestown massacre being promised paradise by Jim Jones. It, it means we might as well be worshiping a rock or a tree or maybe some picture of Elvis. It means that we've believed the lie and are heading to hell. So if a Christian is not risen, if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty. Your faith is empty. And, and thirdly, we are false witnesses of God. We are false witnesses of God. He says in verses 15 and 16, yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. So we, we said God did something that he didn't do. We said Christ was raised by the power of God, but yet he wasn't. So all the verses that say God raised Jesus from the dead, well, they're all false. And therefore, 
you can throw out the inerrancy of Scripture, right? Forget about sola scriptura, not Scripture alone, it's everything else. We can't trust it. Throw it away. And it's ironic, it's ironic because Paul and other Bible writers say, beware, beware, beware of false teachers. Yet Paul and the other Bible writers are false teachers if Christ is still dead. They're false teachers. And all the truth language that Paul used, well, that's all a lie. Like Romans 9.1, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit. Talking about his grief for Israel not being saved. Or like in Ephesians 1.13 where he said that he preached the word of truth. How about 1 Timothy 3 where it talks about the church as the pillar and ground of the truth. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 8 where he said that he could do nothing against the truth but for the truth. So none of Paul le Paul's letters or any other book in the Bible is reliable because they're false witnesses. Uh, and, and Peter blatantly lied when he said in Acts 1.22 that they were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Well, that's a lie. And they are, and we are, no better than the, than the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Muslims or any other religion in the world. We're no better than any of the prosperity preachers. We're not better than them. And, and it's not just the apostles uh, and all other preachers and teachers. It's even the angels. The angels. They got a problem here too. It's even the angels. For did they not say at the birth of Christ, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people? Well, what good tidings are you bringing us? Right? That the grave conquered Christ? Is that the good tidings? And that's going to conquer us too? So if Christ is not risen, they're all a bunch of phonies. Every one of them. And Pastor Phil, you're a phony. And I'm a phony. And Nick, don't laugh, you're a phony. And Benito, and Glenn, and Greg, and Mike Archer, great sermon on, on Friday night, you're a phony. And, and all the Spanish Bible study teachers and all you street preachers, phonies, phonies, phonies. Well, now Paul moves from the theological to the personal and practical. He says in verse 17, if Christ has not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, you're still in them which means you are still an outlaw of God and from God. You are still at war with God. You are still under the penalty of your sins. You are still alienated from God and under the power of sin and under the sway of Satan. And you are still, as Scripture says, a child of the devil. You are still a child of wrath and you are still a son of disobedience. That's Ephesians 2. You're all those things. You're still, you are still unrighteous and you are still not justified before a holy God. And you still do not have a savior from your sin. And God still remembers all of your sin and he is angry with you every single day. And you are just one breath away from an eternal damnation because the shed blood of Jesus was unable to cleanse you. Unable to do it. Because it did not purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It hasn't freed you from the law of sin and death. Hence, God's wrath against your sin has not been, as the Bible says, propitiated or satisfied, right? That's what the, the cross is about. Jesus taking our sins upon himself, God pouring out his wrath on his son for our sins, which we deserve to have poured out on us, but he's doing it in our place. And the resurrection is God saying, good to go, satisfied with that propitiated, I'm appeased. But that would all be no good there if he didn't rise. Hence, you have not been reconciled to God. Don't you dare call God your father because he's not. It means that Christ did not take away sins by the sacrifice of himself once for all. Hebrews 9.28 It means that, that you and I are still governed by the old man. And our hearts are still deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And, and what all of this means is at the end of the day, death will swallow you up because Christ's sacrifice didn't swallow up death for us. That's the problem. Death is the problem. Sin is the problem and sin equals death. And the wages of sin is death. But those wages couldn't be paid if he's still in the grave because Christ's sacrifice did not swallow up death. It means that sin wins. It means that Satan triumphs. It means that Christ loses, and it means we lose if he stays dead. Well, Paul continues in verse 18. He says, if Christ is not risen, then also 
those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And oftentimes in the New Testament, it speaks of the saints who have died, who are believers, as sleeping. Sleeping. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 11. And what Paul is saying is, all your loved ones who have passed away and have trusted in Christ, they're not in heaven. They're not in heaven if Christ didn't rise. Right? Those, those you had great hope and great confidence that they are with the Lord, well, they're not. They're not enjoying the presence of the Lord in a sinless environment with perfect worship. No, they're not. Instead, they are lost forever. So your Christian parents or siblings or spouse or grandparents did not go into the arms of the Lord when they died. Rather, they went into the clutches of death and they are in hell right now. That is really rough language, isn't it? They didn't fly away to glory. They perished. The moment they breathed their last, they, they perished. And perish does not mean to annihilate. It means to be eternally doomed. So we might as well wipe off all those resurrection verses you see in cemeteries, right? All those heaven verses, get them off the stones because they're not there. They're not there. If Christ didn't rise and get there first, they're not there. They're not there, right? If, if Christ did not rise and is in heaven now, you can be sure no one else is in heaven. If he didn't rise from the dead as the son of man and in heaven right now, be absolutely sure no one else is gone. Finally, verse 19, he says, In this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men the most pitiable. All right, so Christ isn't risen. We're a pitiable people. We're a pitiable people. If our hope doesn't go beyond this life, we really have no hope at all. If the best we can hope for is hope in Christ for this life, we have a very unrewarding faith. A very unrewarding faith. Uh, if this is as good as it gets, then we should be pitied. Why? Because we've wasted our lives. Right? We've denied ourselves so many pleasures in this life. We have diligently struggled against sin and temptation. Why? We have disciplined ourselves uh, with the hope of future glory. Uh, we, have, we have picked up our cross and, and we have denied ourselves for what? Why do we do that? We could have enjoyed the passing pleasures of sin because in the end we're all doomed anyway. Right? And, and we should be pitied for the, for the suffering and hardship we have endured for Christ. Like, why are we telling people about him and why are we suffering for him when it ends here? And we should be pitied for the time and the money we've invested in a kingdom that's ending soon. And also the countless hours we spent praying to the one who can't answer anything anyway. We're praying to a dead man. I mean, we pity people who are lost and who are knee-deep in the lies of the culture and who are totally deceived, right, and, and headed for misery. But if Christ has arisen, truthfully, they should pity us. They should pity us because we, are, of, of all people, are the most miserable and, and pitiable people there are. Because we've been trusting in a lie. And... and and we've been sold out, and we've been anchored on something that, that can't deliver. And we have drunk or drank the proverbial Kool-Aid. We did it because we've been living for the risen Christ, and he is, there is no risen Christ. There's no life to come. We put all our eggs in one basket. No eggs. Those eggs are rotten, and that basket is broken. And we should have just all listened to Joel Olstein and, and, and lived our best life now because that's, that's as good as it gets. We should have followed the advice of, of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, where he said, if the dead do not rise, he continues this, and just let us eat, drink, uh, for tomorrow we die. Just live it up. You'll find that in Ecclesiastes as well. So Paul's whole point in this passage is if we don't bodily resurrect on the last day, then Christ didn't bodily resurrect from the grave. And if he didn't resurrect from the grave, then our preaching is vain, your faith is vain, we're a bunch of liars, and you are still in your sins, and all of your loved ones who have died, and you believe are in heaven, well, they're not in heaven. They have perished. They are in hell. And in the end, we are truly the most pitiable people who have ever lived, all because there is no resurrection from the dead. Martin Luther said concerning the resurrection, everything depends on our retaining a firm hold on this doctrine. For if this one totters and no longer counts, all the others will lose their value and validity. And Spurgeon said this, if Jesus rose, 
then this gospel is what it professes to be. If he did not rise from the dead, then it is all deceit and delusion. So let me close by reading to you the very first word in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, which is the word but, B-U-T. And but means some great contrast is coming. It's a word of contrast. And there we read, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the fact is, Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He completed his mission, which was to seek and to save the lost, to redeem his people from their sins, uh, and, and, that, and that he did indeed conquer sin. He did indeed conquer death. He did indeed conquer Satan. He did. And he did burst forth from the tomb on the third day because he was holy. He was the Holy One, and the Bible tells us death could not hold him because he had no sin. He had our sin. He never sinned. Our sin was put on him, and once he paid the price for our sin, he was still holy. He never stopped being holy. And God raised him from the dead because he was holy. Death could not hold him. And as Paul said, he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And Revelation 1.5 says he is the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. And the first fruits were the first fruits of the harvest. And it was an indication of the fruit to come. If the first fruits are good, it's a good first fruit, you know the crop behind it is going to be good. And the firstborn from the dead means the first one to be resurrected from the dead and never to die again. The first one. And the firstborn implies many to be born after him. Many to be born after him. So we are the fruit that follows the first fruit. And we will come after the firstborn. Meaning we will be resurrected to eternal glory just as Jesus was. As he was bodily resurrected from the dead, so too will we be bodily resurrected from the dead. And because of that, our preaching is not in vain. And because of that, your faith is not in vain. And because of that, we are not false witnesses. We are not false witnesses. No. And those who have gone before us, well, guess what? They are with Christ even now in paradise. And you are not in your sins. Christ has taken them away. You are clean and pure and holy as far as God is concerned if you're in Christ. For they've been washed away by his blood at the cross. And the resurrection of Christ proves it all. Listen, if he stays in the grave, how do we know he did it? Remember? Remember he said in the cross, he said, it is finished. And then he finally gives up the, the ghost. He dies. It is finished. What is finished? Everything necessary to save you, to save me, a sinner. Wash away all of our sins. Give us total forgiveness and put over to us an absolutely righteous account. Put his righteous life to our account. It's done. And the resurrection is God's seal of approval. I approve it. I approve it. No resurrection? How do we know we paid them all? Maybe he missed one. Zerada, maybe one got by. Then you're condemned. Because James 2.10 says, if we commit even one sin, we're guilty of all. Right? Paid them all. Paid them all. Proves it all. And therefore, we are not to be pitied, but rather admired by all who trust in Christ. Amen? Now, if on this Resurrection Sunday you really don't trust in Christ, you don't trust in Him, you haven't confessed your sins before God, you are not following Him, you are not born again. You are not born again. Then in the end, truly, you will be the most pitiable of all people. Truly, you will be the most pitiable of all people. Why? Because you've rejected Christ. You've rejected His gospel. You don't think you need Him to save you from your sins. You don't think you need a Savior. Oh, it's okay. I like coming and I like listening. But quite honestly, I'm not giving my life to Him. I'm not surrendering everything to Him. I don't need to do it. I'm not a bad person. I do some good stuff. I help people. All right, I give some shekels here and shekels some there to help people. I try to do the right thing. You've got to understand, nobody does the right thing. There's none righteous, no, not one. 
Nobody deserves heaven. Everybody's condemned because of sin. And Christ came to take it away. So if you reject Christ, you've rejected the one who could take it away. And if that's you today, you need to know you can never make it to heaven and glory on your own. And only slated for damnation forevermore. That's it. That's what the Bible teaches. Not pretty language, but you got it all over the place. And so you're in a terrible situation. But you don't have to be in a terrible situation. Here's why. Because Christ is alive today. It's good and bad, by the way. It's good for those who trust in him. It's bad for those who don't. Because he's alive, that means you've got to answer to him. But that means also you can, answer, you can cry out today and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. I'm a holy offender before you, a holy God. And I deserve your wrath. I know I do. But I know Jesus is merciful. And I know that you love sinners. And I know you sent him to save sinners. Not just those who think they're bad or not so bad, but those who know they're no good and can't in any way make themselves good before you. But you sent Jesus to do it for them. And I'm telling you today, if you trust in him, cry out to him, cling to Christ, admit your sin, and beg him to save your soul. Well, he's not going to turn that away. If you're trusting in his son, if you want him more than you want anything, you will find him. That's the biblical guarantee. But you've got to cry out. You've got to come. You've got to ask for the forgiveness of sins. And he'll give it to you. And he'll give you everlasting life. And he will save you now. And he will raise you up on the day of glory. And you will too have a resurrected, glorified body to go along with your glorified soul. But you must repent and believe. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, how wonderful you are, Lord, that you have devised a way for sinners to become saints, for the lost to be found, the haters of God to be lovers of God. But I thank you in Christ that we have all that hope. You came to save us, O oh God, from our sins, not to make us a better place, but Lord, to take our place, to suffer the wrath we deserve, Lord, to step in between us and your wrath and take it for us so that he could give us eternal life and that you could be satisfied with that and you could give us sonship and daughtership and adopt us into the family of God. Lord, what, what amazing truths, what amazing mercy, what amazing love and grace that you pour out on undeserving sinners. May we exalt you. May we worship you. May we revel in the glory of your word and the glory of your person. And Father, for the souls sitting here or maybe watching this on YouTube or whatever it's on that do not know, have not believed, will not surrender, Lord, will you drive them to their knees? Will you drive them to their cross where they could find life and life eternal and they can know what it means to really live and to truly love and be loved? Will you do that, O oh God, for your glory's sake? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.